All right. Well, today we um, come to a new book of the Bible. We had finished John last, and that was a real blessing going through that all 101 hours that we studied the Gospel of John. Great book. I love that book. That's the book that led me to Jesus Christ as Savior. I always recommend to people, if you're going to start reading the Bible, start in, in the Gospel of John. And then they'll say, what should I read after that? The very next book the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And so we come to this today, having finished our study in John, we will do things decently in order, and we'll work through this particular book. There's a number of things I'd like to say by way of introduction before we actually begin studying every word, verse, and chapter in this particular book. Uh, This book has um, 28 chapters in it. It has uh, 1,007 verses, and it has 24,250 English words. Every one is pure and perfect in the Holy King James Bible. We'll study it. But by way of introduction, I want to say a couple things. The, the very title is attacked, obviously, because of the Christian scholars who are the modern Sadducees are the ones that attack the Word of God and take from the Word of God. Get our tapes on the four types of people. And they will attack this particular book beginning with the very title of the book. They don't particularly like the title that God has given to this book, The Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, a combination of two words found in the Bible, a word called Acts, which is found in the Old Testament, beginning in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11. And it's an Old Testament word, Acts is, and it's not found in the New Testament. It's found in the Old Testament, and it's found in Deuteronomy, begins there, and the last reference is in Psalm 150, verse 2, where it talks about the mighty acts of our great Lord. And it's also a combination of another word, the, the title, Acts of the Apostles. Apostles is a New Testament term which begins in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, and ends in Revelation 21, 14. And uh, when you look at Revelation 21, 14, it says there, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And we will be reading the Acts of the Apostles. These would be the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We will be reading the various acts that they do. It's a combination of two terms, kind of because the book is an interesting transition book, combining looking at Old Testament, transitioning into New Testament. Again, the scholars attack it. They don't like the title. Some of it will call it um, the Acts of the Holy Apostles. Those are some of the scholars that come from Rome because they believe some people are holy and some aren't. But we know that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We don't have any holiness of our own, neither did the apostles. If they had any holiness, it was because God imparted it to them. And if you have any, it's because God imparted it to you. And we praise the Lord and thank Him for that. This is the Acts of Apostles. They were men, men that God used. It's also called sometimes the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This is something that was introduced to me when I was a young Christian because they want me to imitate these apostles and what they do in this particular book. And we'll look in a little bit that this is an historical book and I'll show you why we're not to imitate what the apostles did because we're not apostles. And we'll study that too as we go through it. Uh, So it's not the acts of the Holy Spirit, although it is the Holy Spirit working through them, but it is the acts of the apostles. The title is correct. God does everything right in his Bible, and the scholars are wrong. Some people call this the gospel of the Holy Spirit, and this is not a gospel. There are four gospels. So this is the Acts of the Apostles, and we'll be studying this, and uh, we'll be enjoying the study. Again, we'll try to rightly divide this as we go through it. The author of this particular book is Luke, the beloved physician. Again, the authorship is is attacked by uh, scholars. I don't understand why anybody listens to or reads the work of a Christian scholar. Uh, What we are is disciples. What we are is students of the Word. We are servants of the Lord, but we're not scholars that stand in judgment of His Word. But in this particular book here that I have, this is uh, the Bible Believers Commentary Series, the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Dr. Ruckman was reviewing what some other scholars have written about uh, the authorship of this thing. Let's see... um, Here's the Expositor's Greek Testament used in the majority of um, seminaries and the Bible colleges throughout the world. Uh, The author is R.J. Noling is his name. And he writes, uh, whoever wrote the book of Acts, he has no idea, uh, also wrote the gospel that bears the name of St. Luke, meaning he's not sure that Luke even wrote Luke. 
course, we know better, and I'll show you in a second from the Bible that Luke wrote both books. Uh, another one that's uh, commonly used in, in seminaries is a book written by a man by the name of F.F. F. Bruce. And he's a, a Greek uh, scholar. And he says this, um, a, a real godly comment, The Acts of the Apostles is composed by a first century Christian. Okay, well, let's take a look and see if we can figure out who wrote this book very easily. Uh, starting in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The former treatise... Have I written, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach? Okay, the former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus. The man that's writing this is writing to a man named Theophilus and saying, I'm writing this now, uh, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them. And so now we're going to see, we're going to pick up from where he ended his last treatise, where he was resurrected and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. What treatise might that be? Well, he's writing to a man named Theophilus. Go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Introductory comments in the book of Acts, Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Introductory comments. Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. For as, me- as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And now he writes this treatise to a man named Theophilus, talking about the ministry of Jesus Christ beginning before his birth with the call given to uh, Zacharias, and uh, that they would have a child, John the Baptist, and then the call given to Mary, and then the birth of Jesus, Luke 2, we read it in Christmas, this is uh, the same man wrote both books. Who is it? Well, it's Luke, the, uh, the uh, beloved physician. And so we know who the author is of this book, even though the scholars are still rummaging around trying to find it. You know, the nice thing is, while they're ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, we can just read the book that God's given us and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us into wisdom and knowledge, which is what we're going to do. So the author is Luke, uh, despite the uh, scholar's confusion. Now, the thing to understand is this particular book, is an historical book. And so now here I just want to stand back for a second and talk to you a little bit about the Bible. The Bible, as you know, is a book of books. The Bible contains 66 books. And the books are divided into two major groupings, one called the Old Testament and another grouping called the New Testament. Um, In a study guide written what the Bible is all about, Uh, years ago by Henrietta Mears. She did a nice little library chart here that I think we've circulated a few times. Joe, we've shown this uh, a couple times and passed this out. This is a, it shows like a a bookshelf of, of various books and it basically divides the Bible into Old Testament and New Testament and groupings of books. And the, the way the Lord wrote it is that in the Old Testament you have the first five books are the books of the law. Where the Mosaic law given through Moses, the prophet and priest of the Lord, gives the law unto the nation Israel to begin the Old Testament. And the doctrine is found in those five books of the law. After that, you have 12 books of history that record the historical events that happen in the course of that nation of Israel. After that, you have five books of poetry, beginning with Job and Psalms and the three books of Solomon, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. They're poetical in nature. They're beautiful books. We've read many verses from them. They're great. They draw our heart and our spirit close unto the Lord. It's not that we get doctrine out of them so much. The doctrine of the Old Testament is found in the law. But there's great example and learning in those books. After the books of poetry are the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and his small book of Lamentations, and then Ezekiel, And then Daniel, the five major prophets, or five major prophetical books, four major prophets. And then after that, the minor prophets, the twelve minor prophets. So the Old Testament is broken down into groupings. Likewise, the Lord has broken the New Testament into grouping of books also. The first four being the Gospels. 
And the Gospels give us the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ coming to complete the Old Testament. That's why they follow right after the Old Testament. And yet transitioning into the New Testament of which the very first book after the Gospels is the historical book of Acts. It is a historical book. It gives the history of the beginning of that New Testament institution, the church, which Jesus Christ died for and gave himself for. And so the history will be found here in the book of Acts. We don't so much go for it for doctrine as we go for it to understand the history of how God began a new work after 1,500 years of doing a particular work with a nation, he's now changing to a spiritual nation, something that will not be seen by physical boundaries. Oh, we've entered into their land. A spiritual nation that will spread out throughout the whole world. So it is a historical book. It is a transitional book. It is not a doctrinal book. It's a historical book written around 64 or 65 A.D. How do we know that? The last two verses of the book. Acts chapter 28. Verses 30 and 31. Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt uh, two whole years in his own hired house. Now he's in Rome. That's what the beginning of the chapter was telling us about. He had just arrived in Rome. And he dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. First thing I want to say is he had a right view of teaching. It was about Jesus Christ. Okay, The central point of Scripture is Jesus Christ. The one we uplift is Jesus Christ. The one we preach and teach about is Jesus Christ. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, Him crucified, Him resurrected. Him is the Savior. Him is preeminent in all things. Paul did that. He's doing it at Rome the last two years of his ministry, 64, 65 A.D., just before he was put to death. Okay, So we know the time when this book was written. History. It's got good history in it. Turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Again, we were discussing this earlier, and I, I bring it up again, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, uh, the Lord is speaking to Isaiah the prophet, giving him the sure word, uh, was a little upset that what was happening in his land was although he had brought up children, he said, they do not know me. They're sottish children. They're running around other gods and other idols and other religions and he, he's upset by this and may the Lord have mercy on your soul if you're a born again Christian and you're running around other religions I mean God says right here in Isaiah 41 verse 21 produce your cause for what cause are you doing this saith the Lord bring forth your strong reasons saith the king of Jacob again I like that phrase I like that phrase he's the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and yet you'll never hear him be called the king of Abraham or the king of Isaac. But he does see this, you'll see this phrase, the king of Jacob. Jacob is a Hebrew name that translates into English as James. James is the English equivalent of Jacob. Jacob is translated, alliterated across in Hebrew. And uh, I like that, the king of Jacob. Uh, we have a holy Bible that's King James. Uh, then he says this, producer cause, why are you doing this? Verse 22, let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. In other words, if you want another religion, is there any good prophecy in it? Are your other religious teachers and your false prophets and your, those gods and those idols that you uh, bow down to and those books that they write and the people that write in those false books, can they tell you prophecy? He also says this, and let them show the former things. Is there good history in those books? You know, one of the ways you can discount listen, we have a reasonable faith. It's based on the facts that are written inside the Scriptures. God says, prove me. Try me. Check my book out. Check the history in my book. Find if there's a historical reference I've written in my book that doesn't line up with archaeology. Check my prophecy. Find out if I give a, pro a, a prophetic word if it doesn't come to pass. God says, then try that with other books. Get the Book of Mormon and see if it lines up archaeologically and historically. Get the Book of Islam. And see if there's any good prophecy in there. So get, any, get any religious book you want anywhere. And see if you'll get good history or good prophecy in it. 
and odds are you won't. But the book of Acts is a historical book and God's fingerprints are on it, so much so that to know that there are good things, the former things are written in there. Many, many years ago, in the late 1800s, there was a man by the name of Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey. He's regarded as one of the greatest archaeologists to ever have lived. I'm reading here from uh, page uh, 70 of uh, Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And um, he was a student in the German historical school of the mid-19th century. Now, the German historical schools were, were very... Uh, scholarly and uh, had rigorous teaching methods. Unfortunately, they had become critical of the Word of God. So being trained up in historical method, yet being told the Word of God was just the words of men and not the Word of God, as a result, he believed that the book of Acts was the Word of Men, a man that lived in the mid-2nd century A.D. He was firmly convinced of this belief because he was told, oh, the book of Acts is written much later on. There's not even good history in it. In his research one day, uh, to make a topographical study of Asia Minor, he was going through there doing a lot of work studying Asia Minor. That's the areas we'll read about in Acts where Paul traveled through Asia Minor, Galatia and Phrygia and all these areas where Paul traveled. He was compelled to consider the writings of Luke. As a result, he was forced to do a complete reversal of his beliefs due to the overwhelming evidence uncovered in his research. This is what he said, I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation in favor of the conclusion that this was the word of men. This is essentially what he's saying. On the contrary, I began, you know, with a mind unfavorable to the Bible. But he says, I found myself brought into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for the topography the antiquities, and the society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details, the narrative of the book of Acts showed marvelous truth. I conclude after 30 years of study that Luke is an historian of the first rank. Uh, he should be placed along with the very greatest of historians that ever lived. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect of trustworthiness. I do this, I say this conclusively and finally in light of the archaeological evidence. In all matters of external fact, the author of Acts is seen to have been minutely careful and accurate as only a contemporary can be. Again, falling into the mindset to think that, you know, modern man is the greatest. But there is a man who had his entire uh, life changed. Uh, he bowed the knee and received Jesus Christ as his Savior. As we go through this particular book, I will point out when we come to specific chapters uh, where archaeology confirms exactly what's said in this book. This is an historical book, and this is accurate and good history, archaeologically accurate, as found by one of the greatest archaeologists that ever lived. But remember, it's an historical book. It is a transitional book. God is transitioning his work from the Old Testament to the New Testament, something that he had established and given to the priests and the prophets and even to the kings, through the priests and the prophets of the Old Testament. Now he's going to be changing. God is changing the dispensation with which he is going to work and how he is going to minister his grace to those that believe on his resurrected son. And so this is a book of change and upheaval, a transitional book, historical book, not a doctrinal book. The doctrinal books for the church begin after Acts in the book of Romans. And they continue through the book of Hebrews, 14 epistles that we can get good doctrine out of. And so the, the writings of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, although his Hebrews writing is specifically to Jews and Hebrews, it teaches us a lot about the depth and the interwoven nature of the Old and New Covenants. A lot of good things. That's where you're going to get your teaching from. God's transitioning from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of God. Saw how we ended it? Paul was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. He wasn't preaching concerning the kingdom of heaven anymore. The kingdom of heaven is the manifestation of the millennium with Jesus ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Paul is preaching the kingdom of God where Jesus and God are together all in all ruling above all. The spirit that we must be born of the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. It's a transitional. He's going from the nation of Israel, Old Testament, physical nation, to a New Testament, spiritual nation, the church. Therefore, because of this, if not carefully studied, if not rightly divided, you will have confusion and errors. And that's what abounds in this particular book. The reason I 
almost didn't even want to teach this book is because it is so abused, I almost don't want to touch it. I mean, everyone else abuses this. You turn on TCT, you turn on these other networks, you turn on radio, and you'll hear all these people taking this book and taking things out of context and get causing all kinds of errors. I mean, the major errors that you'll get out of this book. Number one, these are the errors that will come from wrongly dividing this book and not understanding that this is a transitional book. The errors you'll get, number one, are tongues and healing. Tongues and healings. This will be found in chapter 2. This will be an error that will be rampant in Pentecostalism and Charismania or Charismatics or however you want to do it. Okay, Pentecostal is something that started in the late 1900s or early 1900s. We'll study this when we get to those particular chapters and verses. You find this in chapter 2. You'll get the errors too uh, that will be found of baptismal salvation. That somehow that if you're baptized, you're saved. That you must be baptized in order to be saved. This will be found here in error that is picked up by the Roman Catholic Church that teaches baptismal salvation, by the Church of Christ that teaches baptismal salvation, by the Lutherans that teach baptismal salvation, and a number. They'll get their erroneous teachings from this transitional book rather than reading the doctrinal books of the Apostle Paul to the church. Another one that you'll get out of here, another error that you'll get, is the error of predestination. This will be an error that will be picked up by Calvin that was started by Augustine or Augustine or whatever you want to call him and uh, Presbyterians. And this is the concept that some people are elected and predestined to be saved and others are elected and predestined to go to hell no matter what. And they'll pick this up in the 13th chapter. This is the U of the tulip. Uh, T-U, unconditional election, predestination. These are the errors that will come out of this book. That's why it's so important for us to consider this book properly as an historical transitional book. And we have to be very careful if you're going to pick any doctrine from this book. It'll have to be doctrine that you can verily, verily authenticate and substantiate and prove in the church epistles given by Paul. And that's what we'll do as we'll go through this particular book. We'll try and rightly divide this book. Now, another thing that happens in this book, the healings, are part of the miracles that are found in this particular book. The very title would give you an idea that something like this would be taking place. This is the Acts of the Apostles. Apostles a New Testament word. Where's the first time it's found? Matthew chapter 10. So let's go there to Matthew chapter 10. No prophecy of the Scripture is of private interpretation. You just cannot pick out, by the way, all. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Everything written in the Bible is prophetic in a sense because the Bible covers all three aspects of time. And you just can't reach in and pull a verse out and privately interpret it, not even from the book of Acts. You must be able to substantiate it by other parts of the Bible. Now, this is the Acts of the Apostles. It's a good title. What's an Apostle? Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, which is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, And Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So, okay, we start this particular chapter and we see the Lord Jesus Christ calling unto him twelve people. Now, in verse 1, this is what they're called. Verse 1, when he had called unto him his twelve disciples. Verse 1. Verse 2. Now, the names of the twelve disciples. Apostles. Now, do you see? There's in verse one, they're disciples. In verse two, they're apostles. What comes between the word disciples and apostles? That's going to make the difference between a disciple and apostle. Here it is. He called unto him twelve disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, the names of the twelve apostles. An apostle is a disciple that was 
personally given power by Jesus Christ. That's what an apostle is. This book is the Acts of the Apostles. It's not the Acts of the Disciples. It's not the Acts of the Holy Spirit, although it is the Holy Spirit working in them. It is the Acts of the Apostles, whom Jesus Christ himself called and gave power unto. The twelve apostles of the Lamb. You and I will not be able to perform these acts. Many of them. Most of them. We will be able to preach. People respond to the preaching, they'll get saved. We'll study this as we go through it. But these are acts of apostles that Jesus personally called and changed them from disciples to apostles. Jesus would like us to be disciples. Now if ye will continue in my word, are ye my disciples indeed? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You and I can be disciples if we'll have discipline to continue in his word, but we're not going to be apostles. Apostles are foundational in the church. Ephesians chapter 2. They're part of the foundation of the church laid upon the cornerstone, touched by the cornerstone himself, Jesus Christ. So there are miracles recorded in this book. Now let me draw a timeline for you. Again, you can't take a prophecy of the scripture to private interpretation. You've got to pull back from the trees and get a picture of the forest. Let's take a look. Let's do a timeline. Here's Calvary's cross. We're going to go all the way back to the garden. Because when you look at the written verses and words of Scripture, they will start, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and we learn about Him placing men in the garden. So the, 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 the Scriptures will take us from about 4,000 B.C. until John writes his last book here in 96 A.D. And we have the Revelation of John, which again gives us prophecy of the future, but from an historical standpoint, chapter 1, write the things which thou hast seen. The, the writings are in this period here, prophetically they carry forward. So we've got a period like this covered in historical scriptural writing. Okay? The, 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 the Bible has nothing to say historically about the, the fall of the Roman Empire. It was written before that. It has nothing to say prophetically about it. But from a historical standpoint, this is what's covered historically in the Bible. This 4,100 year period. Now observe, if you go through carefully and study your Bible, this would be about 2,000, this would be about 3,000 B.C., that would be about 1,000 B.C., so there's 3,000, there's 2,000 B.C., there's 1,000 B.C. If you go through your scriptures, you know how many times you find miracles? The Bible is not a book about miracles. I know we get all excited about signs and wonders and miracles. The Bible is a book about God, the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ the Savior, and the Holy Spirit, the one that will guide you into truth, the Word of truth, and lead you to the truth, Jesus Christ, who is the truth. It's about Him and His kingdom. And in this massive period that He covers, there are three times where you will see miracles walk on the page of Scripture. The first time you'll see it is right about here. Number one. Who is it? Well, you find in the book of Exodus, it'll be Moses and his brother Aaron. And then you'll find them doing some miracles in in Exodus, a few in Numbers. And then you'll find the apprentice of Moses, Joshua, doing very little bit of miracles, very much, very short in the beginning of his ministry, and then he's done, then he doesn't do any more. And so you've got one little period of time here that's about 40 years in duration. I've gone thousands of years, no miracles. I've got a little 40-year space in here. A little tiny 40-year space in miracles. Around the time of 1450 B.C. And then there's no miracles again in your Bible. Read. Until all of a sudden, you come up later on to a man by the name of Elijah. And his uh, apprentice, Elisha. And they do miracles over a period of about 40 years at around the space about the time of 850 B.C. So you go six centuries with no miracles. And then all of a sudden there's no more miracles. And you read through. They could have used them at the time the Assyrians were attacking. They could have used them at the time the Babylonians were attacking. They could have used them at the time of Esther. They could, they could have used miracles. They didn't get them. They could have used them in time they were regathering and rebuilding the temple. They didn't get them. They certainly could have used them around the time of the Maccabeans. They didn't get any. 
And the next time you have miracles come on the scene is right about here. In a 40-year period, right about here. I, I made this a little larger. But again, about another 40-year period. Number three. Who does it? Well, Jesus. Read the Gospels. And then his apprentice says, the apostles. In the book of Acts. And that's the third time. And you don't get any more miracles. Now, why is this? Why is this? Because God is trying to establish something. I mean, it would be good if we would think, you know, ask God, what's your mind on this? What's he trying to do here? God was, after thousands of years, God is initiating something right here. He's initiating the Old Testament. He's initiating the law. This is the, right here, he uses these two people to initiate. This is the initiation of the Old Testament. Right here. And then centuries pass, about six centuries pass, and they apostatize. And God says, wait a second, did you think I was kidding with what I said back then? Let me show you by miracle power through these prophets. I want to confirm, this is confirmation of the Old Testament. My people hear and turn. And he conf- an initiation of the Old Testament, a confirmation of the Old Testament, initiation through the priests. Moses and Aaron. Confirmation through the prophets. And then along comes his son. And this is the culmination of of the Old Testament. With the king. Here's my son. Hear ye him. Of course, what did the nation Israel do? We will not have that man to be our king. Crucify him. All right. God says, all right, fine. Have it your way. Then we'll change the Old Testament. And I'm going to take these guys forward with a New Testament. And if I'm going to initiate that thing, I'm going to have to give them miracle power. Because we're going to initiate a New Testament now. And, and, and I know these folks are hard of hearing and stiff-necked and they're not going to believe, but let me take these uh, apostles and give them miracle signs and wonders so they know only God could be doing this. You better hear what they're saying. You better attend to what they say that attends those signs and wonders because the signs and wonders will, will dry up just like they did here and they did there. I mean, this is not a book about miracles. It's a book about the Word of God. And when God wants to initiate something in His Word or confirm something in His Word... He brings the miracles, but he does. They're not all over the place, and that might help a little bit. That might stop the confusion. Remember, who are apostles? Disciples that touch the cornerstone and are given the power. I don't know about you, but I never touched the cornerstone. He hasn't touched me, but but I've bowed the knee to him through hearing the word, and I've received the greatest miracle of all, and that's the new birth. All these miracles and healings that will be done by these apostles, even the ones done by Jesus, were all temporal in nature. The man with the brand new hand that used to be withered, he died. The little girl to whom he said, uh, Talitha Kumai, that was 12 years old, lived and died sometime between 70 and 80. Okay? The greatest miracle is the miracle of the new birth. That's the one that gives eternal life. And so the message that Jesus and the apostles want to get is that message across, but God needed to confirm with miracle working power during the acts of the apostles. Now, the, if, you, if you look at it carefully then, the acts of the apostles is really the beginning of the New Testament. The Gospels were like transitional between Old and New Testament and the Acts of the Apostles really is, if you will, the beginning of the New Testament because you're going to see in the second chapter here comes the gift of the Holy Spirit and here comes that church getting added to on a daily basis and growing. So you're going to see the history of the church through this transitional book. There will be some doctrine given, if you rightly divide it, it's Jewish, and there will be doctrine given later on, as you get later and later in the book, where you won't find many errors. They all pull their errors out of the initial chapters. That later doctrine will be Gentile to those of us that the Apostle Paul is reaching out to, preaching the message that by the law, no man could be saved, but anyone that hears and believes on Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, Acts chapter 16. 
Now, as you go through it, and it was very interesting, I was looking at this. Go, do you have a, a table of contents in your Bible that lists all the books of the Bible? If you do, go to the front of your Bible, and if it has a listing of all the books. I noticed all three of these were about 40-year periods where God works miracles. 40 plus 40 plus 40 is 120. We studied Bible math. 12 is God's governmental number. This is a picture of what it's going to be like when Jesus is ruling. All those miracles will be in play when Jesus rules. That's the kingdom of heaven on earth. These were just little glimpses of what it will be like. When Jesus comes back, there will be healings. There will be tongues, the ability for us to talk one to another from different nations about the, about the Lord. Those things will all happen when Jesus comes back. But they were glimpses of what God was doing. Look at the table of contents. So, so if you look at the, your table of contents in your books, and I told you the, the very title, Acts of the Apostles, one is a word that's only found in the Old Testament, Acts. The other one is a word only found in the New Testament, Apostles. And the word Acts is found the most in the books of Kings. If, I went through it. You can get your own concordance at home. Go through it. Although it starts the first time in Deuteronomy, the first five references are to the Lord. But after that, it's the Acts of Solomon, the Acts of David, the Acts of Josiah, the Acts of Hezekiah, the Acts of people that God was working through in the Old Testament. So if you count in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, uh, and count forward, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, the eleventh book is Kings. Kings. There's that Old Testament word where you'll find Acts more than anywhere else. Right there in the book of Kings. That's the Old Testament. I told you this is a transitional book, Old and New Testament. In the New Testament, the, the New Testament really begins with the book of Acts. So if you start at the book of Acts, that being the first book of the New Testament, now I'm not saying, believe me, God's right, the Gospels belong in the New Testament. But I'm showing you from a history of the church, counting from Acts is where the New Testament begins. Starting with Acts is the first book. If you count forward from there, you'll have Acts, and then you'll have the 14 books of Paul. Let's see, number 2 is Romans, 3 and 4 is Corinthians, uh, 5 is Galatians, 6 is Ephesians, uh, 7 Philippians, 8 Colossians, 9 and 10 Thessalonians, uh, 11 and 12 Timothy, 13 Titus, uh, 14 Philemon, 15 Hebrews, number 16 is James. Old Testament, the 11th book was Kings, the 16th book is James. Uh, just a curious thing. As a matter of fact, uh, I just a strange thing, as I noticed, uh, 1611, Kings and James, where it's mentioned. And uh, remember Luke? I told you Luke is the one that wrote this book. One of the ways you know Luke wrote this book is you'll find that he's not with Paul in the beginning of the book. You read through the beginning of the book and you'll find they did this and they did that and here they did this and they were there and he was in prison. And then you get to the 16th chapter of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And it says, Then came he to Derby, And uh, him, verse 3, would Paul have to go forth with him. And then a lot of the pronouns are he's, the third person. And you get down to verse 8. And it says, And they, passing by Maiasia, came down to Troas. Verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Watch this. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Here's where Luke enters from a historical standpoint. Luke shows up in the 16th chapter in verse 9. And the paragraph that he shows up in starts in in verse 9. And it ends in verse 13. See the paragraph marking about the Macedonian vision? It starts in verse 9 and ends in 13. So Luke shows up in this particular paragraph. And the middle verse of that paragraph is the 11th. 16, Acts 16, 11 is the paragraph where Luke comes in. So in order to study this book and rightly divide it, we're going to use a King James 16, 11 where Luke enters, and that's the Bible we're going to use, where every word is pure, and we're going to rightly divide this book as we go through, starting next week, in verse 1. Any questions on what we looked at so far? Amen. Isn't that good? Yes, brother, I see a question. Um, I know you said that this was a transitional book. That is correct. Uh, for the Gentiles. 
Is it also the transition of grace at that point, as far as the dispensations go? Or no? Yes, at that point. This is where you're going to transition from the law to grace. Actually, in the beginning, the Lord's going to attempt to blend the grace over the top of the law and still offer the kingdom to the Jews. Even though they had rejected the king, God of second chances is going to, for about the first seven chapters of this book, he's going to continue to offer to send Jesus back and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. But the Jews will completely turn, completely reject that. They will stone Stephen in the seventh chapter, and then he will transition forth, sending that gospel out to all the Gentiles. And in the eighth chapter, the Ethiopian eunuch will get saved, and then Cornelius the centurion, and things will move out. So we'll look at that. This is a transitional book. You have to be very careful at trying to pluck doctrine out of this book, or you'll get into the very errors that we talked about. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this book and thank you for helping us to see it in the right perspective. That is, it is an historical, transitional book. And although there is good doctrine contained therein, we can't privately take that out. We must compare it to what you gave the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the church, and what the words of our Lord Jesus Christ were spoken. And thank you, Lord, for helping us to rightly divide. And thank you for giving us the new birth, which is what's necessary for us to see and enter the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.